And today we're in for a treat. We have Pace Women's Justice Center doing a presentation for us today. We have Roberta Goodman, Senior Staff Attorney with the Elder Justice Unit. Hi, Roberta, how are you? Good morning, how are you? Good. Would you like me to start? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So um, my colleague, Susan Carroll, who's also an attorney with the Women's Justice Center and the director of our trainings, outreach, and education, will be talking about the center after um, my presentation on important legal documents. Um, so we've, we've identified for this presentation five legal documents. And what's interesting is that they somewhat mirror what the Westchester County Department of Senior Programs and Services um, has published in their My Aging Plan map booklet that they have been distributing for the past few years. Commissioner May Carpenter is a huge advocate for the older adults in Westchester County. And the um, first document that this booklet uh, identifies is a healthcare proxy. And that is what our office at the Women's Justice Center also feels is one of the most important documents that anyone can have in their arsenal of um, documents that help them maintain control of what they want done with their lives while they're alive and after they pass. Um, a healthcare proxy is a legal document where an individual appoints a person to act as their voice, to speak their words when they are unable to do so, strictly regarding medical um, decisions. It is triggered when an individual is determined to be incapacitated. That could be a temporary incapacity or it can be a permanent one. Um, anyone over the age of 18 should have a healthcare proxy. It is not a document that needs to be notarized, but you do need to have your signature witnessed by two people who are over the age of 18, neither of whom has been um, named as your healthcare agent, nor is your treating physician. People ask, can you have more than one agent? You can name successor agents, but only one agent can speak at a time. You can personalize your healthcare proxy. You can say in the document, I want my <clears throat> primary named agent to speak with my alternate agents and with my treating physicians and healthcare providers before a determination is made. You can also put in specific requests about temporarily being placed on um, artificial respiration if the um, likelihood of your returning to a cognitive quality of life state is anticipated. It is important that you include in the document a statement that either says what your wishes are regarding artificial hydration and nutrition and respiration, or a statement that says my agent is aware of my wishes regarding those items. Now, if you are not specific, then it is very important that you have a conversation with your agent. Even, even if you are specific, it's really important that you have a conversation with your agent to let them know how you feel about having extraordinary measures. And if you are not specific, then your agent would need to be providing evidence to the healthcare providers why um, you, the patient, you would want or not want certain treatments to be administered to you. The second document that is identified in the aging plan is accompaniment to the healthcare proxy. It's called a living will. And it is an expression of um, treatments that you would want or not want in the event of being unable to um, share your wishes because you are uh, incapacitated. Now, if you are 
without a trusted person to be your healthcare proxy, either because you have no family or close friends who are still um, alive and can uh, speak for you when you are unable to. Your living will can provide an expression of the treatment that you would want or not want in the absence of someone speaking for you. Um, sometimes at the Women's Justice Center, we have situations where clients may have experienced um, nasty divorces or um, fallings out with family members, and they do not want them to um, be able to make medical decisions for them. And so that information can be included in the living will to say that um, direction should not be coming from a specific individual. What is important to know is that the advanced health directives, this is the category that we're talking about now, is only triggered when someone, as I said, has been determined to be incapacitated and that determination is made by a physician. So if you are at home and you have um, fallen or you've suffered some catastrophic event and a family member or a neighbor calls 911, even though you have a healthcare proxy, which says you don't want extraordinary measures, the emergency medical technicians, responders are required to administer care to you because they are not legally qualified to make a determination whether you lose capacity or not. If you have an advanced medical condition where you have a diagnosis that may be terminal, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you're terminal within three months, six months. There's, no, there's not a necessary time um, limitation. You can have a conversation with your healthcare provider to discuss uh, what type of treatment you would want or not want. And that healthcare provider would prepare a form that's widely recognized, legally recognized. It's bright pink and it's called a MOLST or a PULST form, medically ordered life-sustaining treatment or physician ordered life-sustaining treatment. If that form has been completed and is let's just say on your refrigerator door or the back of your entry door into your home, that then tells the emergency responders that you have recognized advanced directives in place and that they need to follow the guidelines that are in there as to whether you want to have extraordinary measures or not. Our office also recommends that an individual sign a HIPAA release. A HIPAA release is a, a waiver of um, giving a healthcare provider permission to share confidential medical information to a, um, a designated person. When you go to a doctor's office or you go to a hospital, you're asked to sign a HIPAA waiver. That HIPAA waiver is so that the uh, healthcare provider or the facility that you've been to can share your information with your insurance company so that they can get paid. The HIPAA waiver that we are discussing is one where a trusted friend or family member is given permission by you to allow that individual to receive confidential medical information from these healthcare providers. Let's just say you've gone to a doctor's office and you have been on a particular medication and following your examination, the uh, physician has determined that they want to make an adjustment either in the amount of the medication, the number of times per day that you're taking it, or perhaps whether or not you're taking it with or without food. And you walk out of that office trying to um, remember what was said to you, but you were a little distracted because there was a change and the change necessitated a change in your medication. So you can, if you have um, 
created this HIPAA waiver and provided it to your physician's office, you can have that trusted individual contact the physician's office and say, my person was in your office and is not clear on what the new recommendations that you made. So can you please explain them to me so I can sit down and go through them? Um, HIPAA is a federal uh, law and it is designed to protect your privacy, but there are times when um, provided you have someone whom you can trust, that it is uh, a very good document to have in your toolkit. The next document that we recommend for any individual who is over the age of 18, um, and it's probably um, something that maybe college age students might give to their parents, or older middle-aged adults or older adults. A financial power of attorney is a legal document that's created by law that gives an individual the permission, the legal permission to make and transact financial business on behalf of the person that we're gonna call the principal. This um, document, which was um, created by statute, was updated on June 13th of 2021. And it's important to know whether or not you have a current document and if it's been properly executed. It says that regardless of whether you have capacity or not, the person that you're naming can make financial decisions for you. And this is a document that must be notarized and witnessed by two people, neither of whom are the designated agent. You can't have multiple agents acting. This document can be used in a variety of situations. Let's say you've received a bill from the utility company and you notice that the charges on there are not correct. And you've already tried to contact them and you've been on the phone for an hour without any relief. So if you have a designated agent, you can ask that person if they would be willing to speak with the utility company to have them correct the bill. Bank accounts. Uh, sometimes banks require that people use their forms. This document, because it's a New York State document, should be recognized and honored by the banks if it is properly executed. And we need to educate the people that work in the banks that this form is a legal form and that it should be accepted. Um, if your brokerage house, your financial institution requires you to use their form, it's not a bad idea to do that one as well, but just make sure that you're consistent that you have the same agent named in both documents. And just like with healthcare documents, it's really important to have a conversation with the person whom you are asking to take over responsibility for you. This is something that we cannot emphasize enough because if you're just blindly giving a document to someone and saying, please do this for me. They don't know what to do. You need to explain it to them and you need to um, make sure that this is someone who is responsible and will keep you in the loop so in the event that you decide that you no longer want to manage your finances, um, but you want assistance with having them managed. Power of attorney is a document that's only valid during one's lifetime. Uh, when you pass away, the document is no longer valid. And so I recently read an article that uh, talked about a person uh, adding a family member as their power of attorney and saying that when they pass, 
that person will be able to use that account that they're the power of attorney on to access money to pay for a funeral. Well, unfortunately, because when you're paying for a funeral and a person has died, the document itself dies with you. So what can someone do if they want another individual to um, have access to funds and to be able to manage a funeral? Because as many of you may have read wills, it says I direct my executor to pay all my funeral expenses and conduct my funeral. Well, um, the will probably will be uh, four months past your death before it's been read by a court and permission given to the named executor to carry out your business. So that's way too late. So New York State has recognized this situation and has um, enacted a statute called Appointment of Agent to Control the Disposition of Remains. It's a document that you fill out during your lifetime where you designate an individual to handle your body, your remains when you pass. It um, will state whether or not you have made funeral arrangements and you have identified what those arrangements are or whether you have uh, wishes as to where you want to be buried and you have not made the, um, you haven't purchased any plot or contracted for any type of service, but the person who's been given permission to handle your body legally is then able to, to carry out these wishes. We see this document coming into play when sometimes you have uh, second marriages and there are children from the first marriage who say, we want our parent buried with the um, either predeceased spouse or the uh, divorced spouse. And the person who's died would much prefer to be buried with the second spouse or with a sibling. So this document is a good document for someone to have if they have strong wishes um, as to their uh, final resting place. In terms of payment of funeral expenses, if you name someone as a joint tenant on a bank account or you name someone as a beneficiary on a bank account, then that money becomes available to them upon the presentation of proper documentation and they could have access to funds to pay for your funeral. Is it binding on them to use that money to pay for your funeral? No, it's not binding. But once again, it's a, it's a conversation and an expression of what you want um, and asking that person to please honor your wishes. So now we get to the final document. And this is known as the last will and testament. And this is a document that is not triggered until you die. It's, it's important for people to have wills. Um, you don't always have to submit a will for probate to the court if none of the assets of the deceased person um, require the court to supervise the collection and distribution. So under what circumstances would the court not be involved? Well, if you have bank accounts, or any account that has a designated beneficiary, or if you have an account that has a joint owner, because those pass by what we call operation of law. If you own real property, and let's just say the individual who um, you owned the property with, a spouse or a sibling, has predeceased you, and now it's in your name alone, so when you pass, that property is going to have to go through the probate process. Um, I'm going to um, turn the microphone, so to speak, over to Susan Carroll of our office. She's going to share with you what services the Pace Women's Justice Center can provide and whether or not we are able to assist anyone in the preparation of these legal documents. And if there are any questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll take them at the end. Thank you.
Thank you, Roberta. Um, and um, thank you everyone for joining this afternoon. As Roberta mentioned, my name is Susan Carroll. I work alongside Roberta, both in the Elder Justice Unit and as the Director of Training at our office. Uh, in terms of who we are, I just want to give you a quick thumbnail sketch and then focus in particular about the documents Roberta just um, discussed with you in terms of whether we could assist you with them. We are a nonprofit civil legal services provider. We've been in Westchester County and Putnam as well for over 30 years. Our main office is on the campus of Pace Law School in White Plains, but we run three in-courthouse programs. So our courthouse offices are in the Yonkers Family Court, the New Rochelle Family Court, and the White Plains Family Court. In those three courthouse offices, Monday through Friday, five days a week, if you or a friend or family member has the ability to petition in family court, meaning you have that jurisdiction of either some sort of relationship, um, intimate partner or family relationship, and you need an emergency order of protection, temporary custody or support petition, you could come into our office in those three family courts, meet with an attorney and receive assistance both uh, drafting and representing in court. And then we'd work with you either to secure ongoing services, whether you are income qualified for our services or elsewhere. Um, in terms of our other programs, I want to start right with the, what Roberta discussed about the advanced planning documents. Roberta, as you know, is the senior staff member of our elder justice unit. And our elder justice unit helps residents of Westchester 60 and above who may be experiencing aspects of elder abuse concerns. What do I mean by that? Um, it can include runs the gamut. It can be self-neglect, hoarding concerns, people who might not have the money to you know, get their prescriptions because it's expensive, Con Edison and all your other bills with your apartment. Um, it could be, unfortunately, people who might have experienced financial abuse in some fashion from a caregiver, a family member, um, ongoing issues of that nature. Uh, so. Roberta is part of the team that works there, and um, all of our attorneys can be reached at our main number, the 914-422-4069 that I put in the chat. But in terms of the plan advanced planning documents Roberta just discussed, we do have what's called a pro bono, our free program run by our director of pro bono services called the Be Prepared Program. This is geared for Westchester residents about and Putnam, about 55 and above. There is no hard and fast income qualification, but we are seeking to serve people who might not have the resources to draft some of the documents that Roberta just mentioned, such as the power of attorney, healthcare proxy, disposition of remains. The idea behind that is while people have capacity and the ability to make their decisions, we wanna help them draft these simple advanced care planning documents. Now, what won't that pro bono program do? If you need a Medicaid trust or uh, a, a, a you know special needs trust or other types of trust documents, that's not the resource that this program is. This program is simple advanced planning documents like the will, the healthcare proxy, the power of attorney, the most form if necessary, and the disposition of remains. We will also not, um, unfortunately, be able to help you if you have out of state property as well, because that's a different you know your. Planning then will also involve tax considerations, trusts, and for out of um, county or out of state properties. And again, it's not reaching the goal of people who might not have the resources to do these documents. So if you or a family member hasn't done these documents, you're, you know, modest resources and you think this program could benefit you, I urge you to call 914-422-4069. Again, the number's in the chat. That's our main number and our gateway to all our resources. And just mention that you'd like to learn more about getting some advanced planning documents done by our center. And they'll connect you with um, the director is Natalie Sobchak. You don't need to remember her name, but they'll connect you to her and she'll give you a call back. Um, in terms of our other programs, as I mentioned in these three courthouse programs, we do often tend to help people who might have, uh, unfortunately, experienced some sort of abuse with the hands of an intimate partner or a current like husband, wife, ex-wife. And I, and I should caveat that although we are the Women's Justice Center, we help everyone. Our name is from our inception in the early 90s, but our services aren't limited to only helping people who are either women or identify as women. We have high school students up to 90-year-olds and of all genders and identities. So please don't let our name limit uh, your effort to reach out to us or to send our details to anyone else. But in terms of what other units we have, we have a soup to nuts family law unit, um, 
some of their programs are income qualified. So that, that's about the only unit in the office that has that, but they can help with contested divorces, child support custody. Now, the reason I want to say why there might be an income qualification there is because we are federally funded through grants. And so that requires that our clients meet grant qualifications 200% above income poverty guidelines. So it's not that we're choosing to help some people or help others. We know there's a great need out there, but we're trying to reach the people through our grants and foundation donations that won't have the ability to get the help they need. Another unit we have, in addition to Roberta's Elder Justice Unit, um, is the Sexual Assault Unit, and that can help individuals who are victims of sexual assault survivors, whether it's intimate partner or non-intimate partner, and that includes college students in Title IX matters. Uh, we have a legal helpline that gets over 2,000 calls a year. You can reach that by calling the main number, 914-422-4069. Staffed by attorneys, it's free and confidential. That number helps all kinds of legal questions. It's not limited to only helping people who might be survivors of elder abuse or domestic violence or sexual assault. And it can give you referrals to, you know, you need an, you're having an issue with, I don't know, your landlord and Con Edison or something else. Or you have a friend in New Jersey who's looking for divorce resources and she's a victim of domestic violence. We can connect you to resources there. So, again, that's a general number, the legal helpline, and you can get that through our main number. You'll It's answered live. And sometimes um, if they're not available live, you'll get an answering machine that'll prompt you to leave a message and indicate whether it's safe to for us to call you back and you'll get a call back during the week within 24 hours. Um, know that when you get a call back, because our numbers are undisclosed, because we help victims of abuse and we don't want to call someone back and have, you know, Pace Women's Justice Center. So we always ask, is it safe for us to call you back? And know our number will not be listed in name. Uh, the other program we have that can be a good resource for everybody is the, our walking clinic, which is also available remotely thanks to COVID. One thanks to COVID is that you can have these consultations with an attorney for an hour. There's no income qualifications on that. However, the areas that they do consult on are related to our areas of practice. So it's family law matters, elder justice concerns, um, sexual assault issues. Um, that They uh, provide an hour consult. The advantage of that over the legal helpline is if someone, for example, is having issues with a support order or looking to file for custody for their children. They can send documents to us securely. Our attorneys can review them before that hour consultation and they can meet and discuss it either remotely or in person during that consultation. That can lead to intake to our programs, intake to other programs in the county, referrals to private resources. Uh, because we help people um, and our services are free, we recognize there's some people, there's more need than ability to help everyone. We have what's called a moderate means panel that is for people who earn too much to qualify for our family law unit, which again, as I mentioned, is 200% of income poverty guidelines. So rough estimate if you're making about you know, 84,000 and you need a family law attorney, we have cultivated this panel of 32 attorneys in Westchester who get trained yearly several times a year on issues involving domestic violence and elder abuse and dealing with these types of clients and how best to assist them and um, the issues within that. And they've agreed to take cases at a low bono rate, meaning about 100 to 140 an hour with a replenishing retainer of $2,000. Now, our office makes the match, but then we step out of it. So you're not hiring the Pace Women's Justice Center. You're not paying the Pace Women's Justice Center. The money, you know, that 100 to 140 an hour, that's negotiate. That is a set rate, but it goes to the private attorney that you are matched with and that you choose to hire. So I only say that in... Um, to caveat it because it's the one program that costs the client money, but you're not paying us. We're just trying to fill the gap for people who might earn more than they can qualify for free services from us or someone else, but still need that assistance. Um, I think I've probably covered generally who we are. We have trainings and outreach as well, and I'll turn it over to see if there's any questions in the chat. But again, as a reminder, if you're here listening and you think you could qualify or have any interest in that pro bono be prepared program, please give us a call at the 914-422-4069 number. Thank you both so much, Roberta and Carol, for all the information and for having so many services available to the community. There are no questions in the chat at this point. Um, I just wanted to go over once again 
if somebody does feel like they want to work on some of these documents that Roberta presented today and they're low income, they should give a call and, and, and just check if they're eligible to have someone help them with that? Absolutely, Valerie. And again, there's no hard and fast number as to low income. You know, if you call right. us and you have three homes and a condo in Florida, we're going to our, we're going to let you know, we can have a discussion about what documents you might need, but we won't be drafting them for you. And we could, if you need, mm -hmm. we maintain a list of attorneys and the Westchester County Lawyer Referral Association. Because again, we're not funneling people to one provider or one right. attorney, but we do maintain a, a group list of attorneys in various specialties. And we give multiple numbers to allow people to meet with attorneys and make the best fit for themselves. But again, our pro bono program, not a hard and fast economic number. Um, and we're looking to help people who need to do these documents and haven't had a chance to do it. I would caveat as well and say it's not a hard and fast age number. For example, we were in, um, we tabled pre-pandemic quite often in libraries and we had met a library patron in a lower Westchester library. And unfortunately she was um, dealing with uh, stage four diagnosis of cancer, younger, much younger client, um, but hadn't done these documents. and. Although we um, weren't happy for her situation, we were happy to provide her assistance and give her peace of mind to know that at least for this piece of her ongoing concerns, that we could help resolve that so she could focus on her healing and her medical treatment plan. Um, I would, so if there's yeah. any question that you need these documents, don't feel limited by I'm not 55 or because it's meant to help people who need the assistance. I would also add that on occasion, when someone is a client of one of the other units in our office, as a an ancillary resource, we might do a, um, a last will and testament or a power of attorney or an advanced health directive. Case in point might be if someone is receiving services for um, a divorce um, that because they've been a victim of some type of domestic violence or abuse, um, we would um, we would meet with them and we would determine if they didn't have resources outside of New York State that we could assist them with the preparation of documents. Same thing would be in terms of no income limitation. If someone has already had a power of attorney and it's being misused, and they have capacity, um, they could contact us and we would uh, speak with them and determine if it is possible for us to revoke that power of attorney. There are a multitude of factors that would go into whether or not we could assist with a revocation. And then um, if appropriate, we might prepare a new power of attorney document for them. So that is not something where there is um, a an income ceiling or limitation. But I would say that for my program, um, my program at the Elder Justice Unit, you need to be 60 years of age in order for us to provide any kind of legal services. Thank you. And and pretty much everybody who is a member of the NORC is over 60 to begin with. So that that pre-qualifies them for that. That's for and sure. To, and I just want to stress again, because our name can be misleading, we help everyone. We have male clients, we have students. Um, please know that we are not limited only to women. And documentation status um, is not relevant for okay. our Good providing of legal services. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies. That was really very informative. Z, I don't know if you're still on, if you have any questions. Yep, I'm still on. I'm here at the library. Yeah. Um, we did have a question here from one of our staff members who's watching about how to how to know if your family member has one of these, like, and if there's one that's already signed somewhere and it's lost, they, you know, that doesn't supersede if they do one today, correct? So the the ability to do advanced health directives doesn't require um, a revocation, finding an old one. I mean, clearly it would be important if the person who you originally named is is no longer capable of acting or or perhaps predeceased you. 
um, you could just do a new document. As in terms of a financial durable power of attorney, that's another um, that's another story. And the reason why that's another story is because first you might want to determine has that document been filed, provided to a financial institution. So if it has, then you can um, decide, you know, you as the person, the principal who created it can ask to see it. And if it's no longer the individual that you want to serve as your agent or the document is old and while it might still be valid, you want to do a more current one because you still have capacity and you don't want anyone to question well, does this person still have capacity? They did the document 10 years ago. So first find out if it's been filed anywhere. And how would you do that? Well, as the person who is the principal, you might go to the bank with your um, yourself or the person you want to be your agent and say, do you have on file this document? And if if they do, you can revoke it if you want to. It's a formal process, meaning that you have to do a writing. So you have to do a writing where your signature is notarized, where you're saying that I'm revoking the power of attorney dated whatever date is hereby revoked, and you have to serve the person who is the agent with notice that that power of attorney is no longer valid. Um, and you know, people should not keep this document in a safety deposit box. They should keep the document in a file and have their trusted person know where the document is living in, in their home. Um, did I address your question, Z? Yes, and they're also asking, what about a photo of it rather than the original? Do you always have to procure the original or is a photo okay? So financial institutions never accept a photo. Um, what you can do is um, several things you can bring the original to the financial institution and say, make a copy or scan it and give it back to me. Or you can go to the Westchester County Clerk's Office and you can pay to have a certified copy of the document uh, made. Um, and they will keep one on file and they will give you a certified copy back that you've paid for and you can provide that. I find that with credit card companies, and with utility companies, they will allow you to fax or scan the documents so you don't have to be in person to, uh, to present the original. But uh, in, in these other instances, a copy is not accepted. Thank you. And then having a notarized copy is when you show up and then you have a copy in the original and then someone verifies who's a notary that that copy is no, a copy. No, no, no. So um, let's say that you're coming to our office mm -hmm. and you are going to uh, ask us to prepare a power of attorney for you and you're going to name Susan as your agent. So you're going to sit in front of me um, and I am going to go through the document with you. I will have you sign it. There will be two people in the room. Um, it could be myself as the notary and another witness, or it could be two other witnesses plus myself as the notary. And we'll we'll make sure that there is a, a hard ink, a fresh ink, uh, a wet ink, whatever it's called these days, uh, of your signature and the witnessing. And then Susan, if she's in the office and we call her in to say, um, Susan, you've agreed to act as Z's agent, um, please sign your name and we'll notarize you here. You can't, you can't sign the document outside of a notary's, um, in the, it must be in the presence of a notary. And so that would be your original document. And that would be the document that you're taking with you to the clerk's office to ask them to make a certified copy. It'll have a, a special stamp or seal on it that will identify it as such. Um, if you name more than one agent, we recommend that you have that number of fresh originals signed so that each agent can have an original. 
You do not have to give the document to your agents after it's signed. You can keep it until it might be needed. Okay. Thank you for all those clarifications. So like if you, you know, cause people were like, what happens if I need five copies of something? Then, and if they haven't signed five originals, then they need to go to the clerk's office and pay for five certified copies. Right, so that's where the certification actually happens. Yes, in person. So I actually went to the county clerk's office to try and find out if a, a power of attorney that a client was concerned about had been filed. And I did not have with me a um, notarized letter from the client at the time. I happened to have been in the courthouse and figured, let me swing by the clerk's office. Um, because I didn't have the notarized letter, they wouldn't, they wouldn't answer my question. So if you are the principal, you can go to the clerk's office and either hand it to them to make the copy or to find out if an original has been filed with them. Gotcha. All right. Thank you so much for that. That's really helpful. That really lays out the steps and gives a more in-depth explanation of the process. You're welcome. You know, we don't recommend that you, when you have your legal documents signed, that you distribute them widely. And the reason is if you change your mind, then you have these other documents floating around. So, um, we would suggest that you go forward and prepare and have the documents created and that you keep them in a file in your home in a safe um, location um, and they can be accessed as needed. Thank okay. you, that was great. Are there any more questions from anyone who's on the line? You can feel free to unmute yourselves. So I would just add one more thing, that if someone wants to do uh, an, uh, an advanced health directive, a healthcare proxy or a living will, since it doesn't need to be notarized, you can go online to the New York State Department of Health and you can access the forms and you could print them out and you can sign them and do it in front of two witnesses. Um, and then you have a valid document. The financial power of attorney, I would recommend that um, you seek legal assistance because it's a very powerful document, giving someone access to all of your uh, finances and giving them the ability to do transactions. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Nobody's unmuting. So I just want to thank you ladies again for your time and remind everybody that if there's questions, you can always send them to us and we can email Roberta or Susan and they're available to you without us too. So there you go. Thank, thank you, you ladies. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Stay warm. Bye-bye.